My name is Elliot Taves, and I'm the uh, Appropriate Technology Manager here at ECHO. Um, we're excited to have Dan and Elizabeth Turk with us uh, today, um, coming in from Madagascar. And um, Dan is going to be talking about growing mangoes in Madagascar and uh, using that to get um, on a path out of poverty. Um, so Dan was born in Atlanta, Georgia, and graduated from Davidson College in North Carolina with a Bachelor of Science degree in biology. He earned a Master's of Science in Agronomy and Soil Science from the University of Hawaii at Manoa and a PhD in Forestry from North Carolina State University. His doctoral research focused on growth rates of more than 60 native Malagasy trees. And Dan spent two years as a consultant in agroforestry to the, I'm not sure if I'm going to say this right, Dan, Ranamafana <laughs> National Park Project in Madagascar and authored a book uh, titled A Guide to Trees in of A Guide to Trees of Ranamafana National Park. Um, so welcome, Dan, uh, and thanks for taking the time. I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. And when you're ready, you go ahead and share your screen and, and presentation. Thank you very much, Elliot. Let's see there. Can everybody see that? It's coming up. And yep, I'm we actually, got it. And I'm actually coming. I'm just arrived in Madagascar this afternoon. It's now uh, after 10 o'clock there, and Elizabeth is still in Orlando, Florida. So we, okay, we're ready now. I'm trying to get this to, yeah, okay. There we go, why? Okay, Elizabeth and I are uh, mission co-workers of the Presbyterian Church USA. And we have been serving in Madagascar since 1997. We work in partnership with the Fianguni Jesu Christi Edu Madagascar, which is known as its, which is the Church of Jesus Christ in Madagascar. And it's known by its Malagasy acronym, uh, FJKM. And the FJKM is the largest Protestant church in Madagascar with over 6,000 uh, congregations. And what uh, I want, we want to talk about today is the fruit program and some of the aspects of the fruit program that hopefully have gotten it on a path towards some shape of success, hopefully and in the hopes that our experiences can be helpful for, for some of, of you. And I look forward to the, the questions afterwards. Madagascar is a very large island. It's about a thousand miles long, about the size of Texas. It has very diverse climate and ecology such that you can grow quite a diverse set of fruit trees there. In the central part of the island, there is enough cold to grow low chill varieties of peaches, plums, apples, and pears. In the eastern part of the country, there is rainfall almost year round, and you can grow a lot of what I used to call the most tropical fruits, things like a breadfruit and mangosteens and rambutans. The most common tropical, one of the most common tropical fruit trees is the lychee, which is exported to Europe that you see here. Western Madagascar has a very long uh, dry season, six to nine months. It's, I just call it mango country. And the other two fruit trees that are very common are tamarind and Indian jujube. And there are other fruit trees out west, but most of them are, are limited in occurrence. Uh, they, they're grown where the people can get them some, some added water. In the far south, there is uh, very little water, 
less than 500 millimeters per year on average. And right now you may have seen it in the news that there has been drought over successive uh, years leading to over, there's talking about a million people needing emergency food assistance right now. And about the only fruits that do well in the far south are cactus fruits. These are prickly pear cacti from the Americas in the genus Opuntia, uh, several species. And during some parts of the year when times are tough, uh, many people eat cactus fruits exclusively. And that's not real good nutrition, but other way of saying it is if it weren't for cactus fruits, there really wouldn't be hardly much at all standing in the way of starvation. I work with a, an FJKM program called the Fruits, Vegetables, and Environmental Education Program. And we do those three things. We educate about environment, and grow fruits and vegetables. And I want to introduce you with two of my main colleagues. This is Roland Razafiarsson, who is the coordinator of the FVEE, and he is an excellent community organizer, one of the best in the country. And Germain André Naivousson is our fruit propagator. He's probably grafted more kinds of fruit trees than anyone else in the country. Both Roland and Germain are excellent trainers. When I first got to Madagascar as a mission coworker. I was asked to do what I could with fruit trees. So I started looking around to learn about the fruit trees that are grown there and also about how they're grown and what the Malagasy culture is associated with growing trees. So I wanna share with you a few of the important lessons that my colleagues and I learned. First of all, Madagascar has a good market for fruits, especially in the cities. And this seems to be because people like eating fruits for dessert. So if you have someone serves you a good meal, like at a training, then you're likely to get maybe a banana for dessert or a tangerine or a persimmon or something. Most of the fruit trees growing in Madagascar are grown right around houses. I would call them backyard trees, except they're in the front yard as well. And uh, grown this way, they tend to get water and compost that gets thrown out, but they also benefit a lot from the security that being close to where people live to, that that offers. And there are relatively few places in the country and few farmers who are growing more than 10 trees of what you might really call and an orchard designed for more purely for income. Madagascar, in terms of poverty, it, it has major problems um, in terms of economy, in terms of availability of, of money in the household. So growing fruits is inherently a low investment endeavor. And this is in stark contrast to growing fruits in places like the United States, where it's a very high investment endeavor. So any effort to help promote fruit growing has to take that into account. That You can't plan for, if you want to help low-income farmers get involved, then it can't involve much investment of either time or money. People have to spend their time uh, getting food on the table in the short term for their kids. There's not much grafting going on in Madagascar, a little bit with citrus and with uh, peaches, a uh, tiny bit with uh, mangoes before we came along and basically no one was grafting avocados before we came along. There is no, as far as I know, there's no Department of Horticulture at any university in Madagascar. And so going along with this, there's really not much research going on either by government agencies or non-governmental agencies in the country. 
There's no uh, effective national extension program for farmers, so you can't just call up the local county extension agent, the equivalent, there is no equivalent. So farmers are left to do whatever innovation they do sort of on their own. And at the same time, because of their financial situation, they can ill afford risk. So it's a tough situation for farmers to be in. Non-governmental organizations are really not doing much with fruit trees in Madagascar. And this seems largely associated with the fact that most of their funding, their, their work is with projects that are often only two to three years long, or if they're longer, they're sort of renewable and they don't know if they're really going to continue. Um, there are a few long-term tree nurseries. A lot of the tree nurseries, whether they're fruit trees or, or, or especially for reforestation, they are project nurseries. And when the nursery worker is no longer getting paid, that's, that's when the nursery stops. So what did we conclude from all this? We concluded, first of all, that there's tremendous potential for fruit, growing fruit trees to help low-income farmers get on a path out of poverty. They need technical help. They need uh, good fruit varieties. There is also tremendous potential for organizations such as the FJKM Church to be at the forefront of fruit growing efforts and promotion in Madagascar. And this is because of the FJKM's commitment to holistic ministry, its, uh, its long-term perspective, and the deep relations that it has with people in the communities all over the country. And we had uh, my colleagues and I had an, an experience early on that really brought home this concept of tremendous potential for growing fruit trees to help farmers get out of poverty. And it had to do with some of these, these tangerines in this picture. We learned that there is a town in Midwestern Madagascar, about six hours uh, from the capital city, where a lot of these tangerines come from. And it's a place called Bambiati. And for me, going to Bambiati is a kind of out of this world experience. What in the world is that truck full of tangerines doing in this landscape? It just seems completely out of place. And the, and the villages along the way, they just have your regular um, trees, a few trees around the houses. But then you get to Bambiati and the whole town is surrounded by orchards and people like Madame Vwangi can tell you all about all the techniques that they've mastered and they've developed and mastered and how you grow those tangerines. These are seedling trees. They've been grown up and their branches spread apart using bamboo sticks. Um, the people use cow manure for fertilizer and they twist the arms of those truckers who bring their trucks and they say, hey, bring me fertilizer when you come if you want to buy tangerines. So they get supplemental cow manure with the trucks. But one of the things you don't see here that is probably the key is the water for irrigation that is channeled from up above the town to irrigate the tangerine orchards of of Bambiati. And the town of Bambiati is not like the other towns in that area. The houses are two-story houses with metal roofs. And the children, the, the children of these tangerine farmers are going to universities in different places all over the country. These are people who've essentially gotten out of poverty by growing tangerine. So my colleagues and I looked for a place where we could do similar, and we found a village called Antaneti Bay, which is about two hours northwest of the capital city, and it has that key ingredient I was mentioning. It has water available for irrigation. So the first thing we did was invite two people from Antaneti Bay 
to get trained in growing fruit trees. And as part of that training, they went to Bambiati to see for themselves those amazing orchards. And these were Cyril Rakutvar Manana in the yellow shirt and Jose Rangiari Manana in the lower right. And when they went back home, they shared their enthusiasm with the other people at Antoneti Bay. And then we started doing, I say we, it was my colleagues at the time, started doing trainings at Antoneti Bay for anybody who wanted to grow tangerines. And eventually there were 70 families who started growing tangerines there. And fast forward, they started getting the first fruits after about four years and after seven years. These were planted in 2010, this is 2017. And some of the people who took particularly good care of their trees are really starting to get some good yields. But things really started to take off in 2020 when word got out via Facebook and truckers started coming to Antoneti Bay from the capital city and buying tangerines by the truckload. So Cyril there in the striped shirt, he and another person in the village have, have their own little nurseries where they sell these seedling tangerine trees. And Cyril also gets called on by other people to come help others in other communities to start growing tangerines. So tangerines have really been a blessing to the people of Antoneti Bay, just as they were to the people of Bambianti. But we recognized early on that a major limitation is the requirement that these trees get irrigation water. And it's really not that many, even though the, the relief is very hilly, it's not that many places where you can channel in the water like this to be able to grow tangerines. So we asked ourselves, is there another kind of fruit that would be able to help a lot more people than the tangerines? And we realized that the mango is that fruit. And the reason is that mangoes grow very well through a vast zone of Western, Northern, and much of Southern Madagascar. They don't need supplemental water after their first year of establishment. They grow and produce fruit well on soils of low, relatively low fertility. And the fruits command a good price in the market. So they're readily marketable. Another thing has to do with, the potential has to do with how they're grown now compared to how they could be grown. And so how they're grown now is there's hardly any, there's no grafting going on except in one real exceptional area and then the people we've been training more recently. So mangoes that you typically see are seedling trees, they're giant trees. You get a, you lose a lot of fruit from the, the fruit that fall and get bruised. And most of the varieties that are grown, most of the trees that are grown are from varieties that aren't particularly high quality, people would tell you. So we really feel that a mango revolution can be had by focusing on helping people to grow good commercial quality mangoes. These are mangoes with high market value that produce real well and have a long shelf life. And then add to that empowering people to be able to graft mango trees themselves so that they can grow as many of those good varieties of mangoes as they would like. Those we feel are the two main components of a mango revolution in Madagascar. And our program, the FVE fruit program, has six components that we feel are crucial for the success of, the, of, of this revolution going forward. I'm just gonna cite them and then I'll go back through them. First is working within the structures of the FJKM to amplify the work that we do through existing uh, structures within the national, the church, getting a collection of good varieties so that we can identify varieties that will be particularly helpful for farmers, 
helping the farmers to learn innovative growing and prop propagation techniques, particularly grafting, as I mentioned. And then we've set up a fruit center that we call the Mango Palace, which is a place where we can evaluate varieties. We can uh, do research there, and we can also uh, conduct trainings there. We've been setting up sustainable tree nurseries. We obviously have outside funding right now, and that is important. But at some point, we're not going to have that anymore, at least not in the form it is now. And so being able to sustainably provide lots of grafted uh, mango trees in particular to supply the needs of farmers is very important. And then we have a training uh, program for farmers to help enable them to get involved in growing uh, mangoes at very low cost and then do as much as they want to and, have, and to benefit as much as, as they want it to benefit them. So working within the structures of the FJKM, the main structure we work with are the seminaries of the FJKM. My colleagues and I teach a course in growing and um, propagating um, fruit trees, growing vegetables, and also fruits. As part of that, we have a great big um, garden at one of the seminary garden and orchard and the students and their spouses are involved in all aspects of taking care of the trees and the vegetables and they eat what they produce and that is a huge benefit to them uh, while they're students but also later when they're pastors to be able to grow vegetables for their family and to be able to share some helpful techniques with their their neighbors they grow they learn to a lot of nursery techniques including grafting so every year, the FJKM is putting out between 40 and 70 new pastors who have had horticultural training. And so the numbers in the country just are growing and growing as we train more and more. And every year, they, these new pastors receive fruit trees to plant at their first churches. A lot of pastors don't take them with them right away, but they come back and get their, their fruit trees. This is Pastor uh, Clara Ranuru Suahantra, who's come back to get her uh, fruit trees to plant at her, her churches. And some of these pastors really incorporate either vegetable gardening or fruit growing into what they do as pastors, into their ministries. We just learned recently that Pastor Tafita Razafindra Naivu in southwestern Madagascar, now has 700 citrus trees producing fruit. He's grafted about 1,500, and he got the scions from the seven citrus trees that he received when he left seminary. These are mostly lemons and oranges that are working, doing well for him, and he's starting to sell them in one of the big cities in southwestern Madagascar. The FEE also has a program of planting fruit trees and native trees at FJKM churches and schools and other uh, church properties. The idea, idea being simply to have a lot of places where people can come and see trees growing and form their own opinions about them. And this program just got amplified this year when the FJKM decided that all FJKM churches should become green churches. And so my colleagues and I are gonna to try to help promote the idea of fruit trees and native trees being key components of green churches. The leadership of the FJKM has been and will continue to be involved with the um, activities of the FEE in many different ways. Just this past office at August at the FJKM General Assembly, it was decided that the activities of the FEE should be extended to all 37 FJKM synods in Madagascar. So in the first few months of, of next year, we'll be training uh, people from all 37 synods in how to grow and graft fruit trees. We've been collecting a lot of fruit varieties, especially mangoes. We now have um, somewhere around 90 varieties of mangoes. And some of these are 
what we consider as the best from Madagascar. And many are some of the best, best from different parts of the world. And a lot of these trees from all of the trees from outside Madagascar, we got them to Madagascar with help from ECHO. We're very grateful for ECHO helping to um, prepare, assemble and prepare ship loads of trees to go to Madagascar in our luggage. And they went with a, a, an import permit from Madagascar and a phytosanitary certificate that ECHO helped us get. And we're just very grateful for ECHO and being part of these efforts. And those um, mangoes you saw in the previous picture, by the way, those were ones that were produced this last year. So a year ago, January, on trees that were four years old. So we're just starting to get fruits from a lot of the trees that we planted. We don't just grow mangoes. Some of the other trees that we feel really have a lot of potential are canistels, mamesacores, a chipota cava, also uh, breadfruit, nectarines, um, even some of those uh, big varieties of Indian jujubes. So there's others we're working with. It's just that we feel that, that mangoes, we're ready for them to really start helping people and we don't need to spend our time evaluating them or propagating them. We can go ahead and launch that. So we're trying to develop um, good growing and propagation techniques. If we're gonna be training people, it's good if we know what we're doing before we try to tell other people uh, some good ways of doing, or some supposedly good ways of doing things. One of the grafting techniques that's been particularly helpful is the approach graft, which is widely practiced in India. And one of the reasons it's helpful is because when a trainee gets a grafted tree, about as fast as they can grow a rootstock, they can then graft off of that little tree and start to practice what they've just learned in their training. They don't have to wait until their tree gets to be four or five years old to get scions to start grafting. We also do cleft grafts and veneer grafts of, of mangoes and chip buds of, of citrus. And one thing that's quite simple, but it's also quite challenging is the labeling. We are trying to put the effort that's needed to get all the trees labeled that need labels. So when we're grafting lots of different varieties, I can't tell them apart when we, right after we graft them. So um, trying to label them. And then when we plant them in, in orchards, we keep labels on them, but we also um, draw out maps that we try to keep in good places to keep track of what is what. On to the Mango Palace. The Mango Palace was just a dream when this picture was taken back in 2016. It's located uh, just off of, of National Road number four that you see in the upper left-hand corner. It's about four hours northwest of the capital city at about 800 meters elevation. So it's just on the eastern edge of the vast mango growing zone of western, northern, and southern Madagascar. We planted the first mango trees there in January of 2017. So right now, the oldest trees are still less than five years in the ground. This is what the Mango Palace looked like in March of 2020. There's a um, large orchard there, more than you can see here, as well as a big, um, nursery there, and also facilities for being able to conduct uh, trainings. One of the things that we're able to do at the, at the palace is to offer internships for university students. So the second year agronomy students from the FJKM University come every year to do a, an internship of a week to two weeks where they learn all about fruit trees. They also get out in the community and get their feet wet, learning about uh, growing rice. And they go to the farmers, that some of the farmers that have been trained at the center and do follow up with them and, and, and evaluate how that's working. 
And so some students come back for to do special projects as third year students. And we've had one student do her master's uh, research at the Mango Palace, and we expect more to be coming. We are working to establish sustainable fruit tree nurseries. This is the nursery at the Mango Palace. The primary purpose is to produce trees that we can give away as part of the trainings that we do. But it's very important that we sell um, trees out of the nursery to get income to provide for the sustainability of the nursery. This is a nursery at Mandritsara in northern Madagascar where the FJKM has a, a seminary. This is a much simpler setup where um, as the FEE provides um, the investment in the infrastructure for the, the initial investment for the nursery. In this case, the biggest thing was that house where the nursery manager uh, lives and he provides security just by being there. Also a fence, you can see the edge there. Those are mother trees still in big pots just before they got planted out. The FE provided that. They provide the, the other infrastructure and they provide the training. Jeremy Ratsarauna and I got trained for about six months. He got stuck because of COVID and got very well trained. This nursery is being installed by the FEE, but is managed by the seminary. So we're setting it up for them. This is another nursery in progress in South Central Madagascar. It's right on National Road number seven, the main highway to Southern Madagascar. A big first step was putting in a wall around the nursery to keep the cows out. So that's, we really can't plant trees there until we have protection from the cows. So this nursery should be finalized. It's gotta be finalized in 2022. And we expect it to provide a lot of grafted mango trees for Southern Madagascar. After the nursery is set up, the FE continues to provide inputs and a salary for the, the nursery manager for three years. So the nursery's got three years to build up enough reserves and enough income coming in to be able to be sustainable without outside uh, funds after those three years. The FEE will continue to provide technical assistance as long as we are able. Our training program got started in late 2019, as soon as we started having grafted mango trees produced at the Mango Palace. And these are typically for church uh, members and low-income farmers, depending a little bit on the, on the training. This was done at the uh, nursery to be at Ankara Mana, partly just to get the church community on board with that uh, plan for the nursery. Madame Agnes Rasua Nirina had this to say, had she what she had to say about the nursery, but the, about the training was that she really liked it because she said, before when I did trainings, the technician did it and said, that is how it is done. But here it was me who did it. I did the graphs, she said, my hands made the graphs. And that is just reflects the practical nature of the trainings that we do. It's very much hands-on, they do it. Uh, they, you know, graph multiple kinds of graphs, graphs multiple times. They mix up the nursery mix. They dig the holes for planting the trees. It's very, very practical hands-on training. And when they finish the training, they take trees home. Usually it's four to six um, fruit trees with about half of them being grafted mango trees and all the varieties, there's a bunch of different varieties among those and all those are carefully recorded who's getting what. They're also getting a grafting knife, a sharpening stone, um, an initial supply of pots for the nursery and some plastic for wrapping grafts. 
So basically they're getting all they need to continue practicing what they've just learned once they get back home. So some of these trees have now been uh, growing since late 2019. This, these were actually just one year old. And um, I think she's really smiling pretty good on the right, but I can't wait to see her smile when that tree starts to produce fruits. One of the big trainings we did this past year was for 50 people from a town called Sarahunenana, which is about 50 kilometers northwest of the Mango Palace. It's right on that national road number four. And so these, and the idea there is to help these people benefit from growing mangoes as much as they would like to, to really realize the potential of mangoes. Their market is right there on that road, truckers driving by. They don't have to send their mangoes to market, it comes to them. And so we've done the initial training and then we're going, starting to go back to train all the people who want to take part, help them get trees, help solve their problems, give them encouragement, just like we did for the people of Antoinette Bay with tangerines. So that's a challenge for us, and we're really looking forward to seeing what will happen with those mango trees going forward. Another kind of training that we do is for what we call volunteer technicians. And these are volunteers who've been selected by their parish. So it's usually one person per parish and they get trained along with the pastor. So a pastor sometimes serves multiple churches and they get trained in how to grow and graft fruit trees with the ideas that the, and plus they get trained in how to do trainings themselves and how to share their skills with others. So the idea is, that the, the parish will use these, these volunteers to help with tree work in the parish. And this will be doing trainings. This will be maybe growing trees at churches, taking part in that green churches uh, plan and uh, re even reforestation. And so we're really encouraging these volunteer technicians to set up their own nurseries. This is partly because that's how they're going to get good if they continue to practice what they've learned. And it's also a way of, of them being able to have some source of income and to be able to provide trees into the community. So this is Roman Ranjanarimanana and some of his uh, nursery. He's been marcotting lychees, grafting citrus, and he has mangoes for rootstocks that he's growing there. So we know not everybody's gonna set up their own nurseries, but we expect quite a few will do that. One of the exciting uh, trainings we did recently was for the pastor and a volunteer technician from each of 28 FJKM evangelism posts. And we, we selected the, the places that were in mango country in Southern and Western Madagascar for this initial training. And so they really had a lot. These are, these are people who serve in really remote areas. So being able to have something that will help people improve their nutrition and income where they serve is a really potentially a really helpful thing. And we look forward to doing follow up with them to help them um, set up nurseries and move forward with that. Another thing that we've been a real fairly successful at is getting collaborating with the national television station to get them to they send a television crew to so they've sent them to some of our trainings to document what we're doing and then share that all over the country on national television. So that's been really helpful, a helpful way of getting the word out. And it gets me those good quotes, like from the lady who said she liked the, the training that went out on national television. So this mango revolution that we think has started is still very much in its infancy. 
we expect it to really gain a lot of momentum when the trees that have been planted start to bear fruits, when the nurseries start to put out thousands of grafted mango trees every year, and when some of these uh, volunteer technicians start to make uh, money from selling fruits and selling grafted trees and really start to get uh, trees out in the community. So we're really super excited about it, about what the future holds. Some of our emphases going forward will be putting a lot of effort into helping these nurseries become sustainable. We need to become better at grafting to get a higher percentage of success. And we need to up the numbers that we're producing each year. We will be continuing to do as much training as we can, and we'll be trying to do a lot of follow-up with people. A lot of times this is by phone initially. We hear people, they have questions, things that don't work, or can you send me something? And then try to follow up, uh, especially with the ones that are really excited about doing things. And we will be extending our work to the South in a number of different ways, because even though we probably can't grow mangoes very well in the very, very far south. There's plenty of areas in the south where mangoes could contribute quite a bit to reducing the hunger and malnutrition in the south. So I just want to say, thank you very much for uh, coming to the talk.